But what I'm going to talk about now is his tax cuts, which I think is actually something that probably a lot of people remember. So, like I said, um, with Bush, uh, when he took office, um, one of his signature pieces of legislation was his program of tax cuts. So these took place in 2001 and 2003. Um, of course, at the time, Bush and Republican lawmakers promised that these cuts would stimulate the economy and, quote, pay for themselves. Of course, that didn't happen. Uh, there was a report that came out a few years ago from the Congre Congressional Research Service uh, that actually found that GDP in the U.S. fell dramatically in the wake of the Bush tax cuts. Uh, so if you can see from this chart, um, obviously the economy after the tax cuts, not doing that well. So the report uh, is based on a study looking at economic trends over a period of like 65 years. Um, and they found that there's no evidence whatsoever that tax cuts, A, create more jobs, or B, help the economy, which of course is always what the Republicans are claiming. But what did actually happen as a result of the Bush tax cuts? Uh, for one thing, economic inequality went way up. The top 1% of households got even richer and increased their after-tax income by more than 5% each year. On average, households in the top 1% received a Bush tax cut of more than half a million dollars. Uh, and I should mention, you know, taxes did decrease slightly for middle class households as well. Um, but obviously, as the chart we just looked at shows, the lion's share went to the top income earners. So in other words, while the rich were getting richer during Bush's time in office, literally no one else was. In fact, median wages for workers with a high school diploma decreased by almost 2%. The poverty rate also rose steadily over Bush's two terms. Now, while all of this is going on, Bush is also running up this massive deficit, right? So he he came into office with an unprecedented budget surplus. Um, of course, his tax cuts basically annihilate that immediately um, and ultimately end up adding around $1.8 trillion to the deficit. Now, Republicans, of course, care very, very deeply about the deficit. So what did they do? Well, in early 2006, Bush signed into law the Deficit Reduction Act. Uh, like its name suggests, this is a measure designed to curb the ballooning deficit. Of course, instead of doing that by reversing Bush's earlier tax cuts, the thing that caused the deficit, Republicans unsurprisingly chose to address the deficit by tightening the belt on social services. Uh, so this piece of legislation reduced spending on programs including Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security. And... Um, a uh, kind of lesser known component of this bill is that it also reauthorized welfare reform. So welfare reform, of course, is begun by Bill Clinton in the 1990s. Um, but when Bush takes office, he worked with Republicans not just to reauthorize welfare reform, um, but also to impose even stricter work requirements on welfare recipients. Um, and he also started funneling money toward things like marriage initiatives and faith-based charities as these new solutions to poverty. So I want to pause for a second on um, the marriage initiatives because they're like a little bit crazy. Uh, basically, what happened is the Bush administration dumped millions of dollars into these, quote, marriage education programs, um, which were basically like relationship counseling courses designed to teach poor people like how to stay in healthy relationships, how to raise stable families. Um, because, you know, the thinking or like the argument from conservatives at the time was that if people stayed married and, you know, pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and learned some personal responsibility, uh, they wouldn't be poor anymore and they could get off the dole. Now, big surprise, uh, this didn't work at all. A few years later, the Department of Health and Human Services conducted a study and they found that these relationship counseling courses for poor people not only did not reduce poverty, um, but didn't really improve people's relationships. So I wanna read a quote from a Mother Jones story uh, on this. They write, Re researchers reported that the program had produced precisely zero impact on the quality of the couple's relationships, rates of domestic violence, or the involvement of fathers with their children. In fact, couples in the eight pilot programs around the country actually broke up more frequently than those in a control group who didn't get the relationship program. The program also prompted a drop in the involvement of fathers and the percentage who provided financial support. Um, so again, millions of dollars squandered. This program not surprisingly, doesn't work at all. 
Um, and, you know, I think this program, along with um, the faith based charities that Bush promoted over more government aid, um, together kind of make up Bush's, the, the foundation of Bush's philosophy of, quote, compassionate conservatism. So, this is, of course, this notoriously ambiguous concept uh, that Republicans like to invoke when they want to sound slightly less draconian. Uh, really, as we know, it's just a vague way of saying to working people, you're really on your own, but maybe there's a church somewhere that can help you. So um, I guess all of that said, though, I, I think in many ways, one of the most significant things about uh, Bush's domestic economic policy was that it was really just one point on a long line of bipartisan austerity measures. So as I mentioned before, it was Clinton who famously enacted welfare reform in the 90s. Um, this is a program that uh, essentially ends cash assistance and moves the country to a system of workfare. Um, we now know, thanks to decades of research, that workfare is extremely punitive. It doesn't actually help people get jobs. It really just throws people into deeper poverty. So on the subject of work requirements, um, Bush, Bush didn't invent them by any stretch of the imagination. He really just doubled down on them. And, you know, even the marriage initiative stuff and the faith based charities like that sounds like, you know, really like hardline conservatism, and it is, um, but these programs actually came out of clauses in the original welfare reform bill. So they were again, started by Clinton. And, um, you know, I think this kind of culture of poverty mentality, which says that, you know, people get trapped in destitution because of the way they behave or like what their family looks like. Um, you can really trace this all the way back to the 1960s to liberals like Daniel Moynihan, right? So again, you know, just to reiterate, I really think that the Bush era programs um, were not in, in many ways a radical departure from what came before, but rather an instance where a Republican was able to take advantage of um, some precedents that had been set in decades earlier and further entrench austerity. And, you know, just to kind of underscore the way that these measures span both Democratic and Republican administrations, um, I want to return to Bush's tax cuts. So some of you might remember that in 2008, Barack Obama ran on a pledge to undo the Bush tax cuts. However, once Obama took office, that promise went out the window. On your taxes, or if you've been laid off, your jobless benefits, with the deal President Obama struck with Republicans on both and the backlash to it inside his own party. Mr. Obama agreeing to extend Bush-era tax cuts for all Americans, even the wealthiest, which he vowed in the campaign not to. In return, getting a payroll tax cut and 13 more months of jobless benefits, both helping the working and middle class. The president tonight signaling he was reluctantly trading one pillar of his campaign, the one on taxes, to preserve another, his pledge to get beyond partisan squabbling. I know there's some people in my own party and in the other party who would rather prolong this battle, even if we can't reach a compromise. But I'm not willing to let working families across this country become collateral damage for political warfare here in Washington. And I'm not willing to let our economy slip backwards, just as we're pulling ourselves out of this devastating recession. So what happens? In 2010, Congress, of course, passes the bill with large majorities of both Democrats and Republicans in the Senate supporting it. Uh, this was in part thanks to Joe Biden, a VP at the time, of course, who worked tirelessly to round up the Democratic votes. Uh, in the end, the bill was seen as this, you know, real triumph of the Obama administration. The Washington Post called the deal, quote, the most significant tax bill in nearly a decade and said that it spoke to, quote, the resilience of the occupant of the Oval Office. So, you know, in that sense, maybe it shouldn't be that much of a surprise that these days the Obamas and the Bushes seem to get along famously. So I think I'm going to wrap up there, but I do want to quickly mention that in 2010, there was some opposition to extending the tax cuts. And one senator in particular spoke for over eight hours in an attempt to filibuster the bill. Here is a clip from that session. Our Republicans want, for Republican colleagues, want huge tax breaks for the richest people in this country. But the reality is, is that the top 1% already today owns more wealth than the bottom 90%. How much more do they want? When is enough enough? Do you want it all? We already have millions of families today that have zero wealth. 
They own less, they owe more than they own. Millions of families have zero, below zero wealth. We are living in a situation where the top 1% owns more wealth than the bottom 90%. Top 1% owns more wealth than the bottom 90%. And Mr. President, that is simply unacceptable. So, um, you know, I just wanted to play that clip. By the way, you can watch all eight and a half hours of the filibuster if you want on YouTube. Um, you can also do what I did and just kind of fast forward to the end uh, where you can see that Bernie is like still at peak fighting game. He's on his feet. He's still yelling. Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, but I, I really just bring up that clip because, you know, I think Bernie gets a lot of flack for kind of saying the same things over and over. And the reason that he does that is because the Democrats and the Republicans keep doing the same thing over and over. Um, so I think, you know, just on that note, um, I will wrap up and turn it over to Ariella, who actually has a personal anecdote about some of these marriage initiatives from the Bush era. Oh, Ariella, you're muted. All right, there we go. Um, yeah, like we said, like you said, uh, these are kind of a Clinton era welfare reform right in and, and Bush expanded that program. When I was pregnant, um, I was on Medicaid and I was encouraged to join in a program at the provider that I was seeing for my care that they didn't really tell me they were like, oh, you get extra vouchers to like babies are us every time you go. And they just like talk to you about your experience and stuff. And I was like, oh, that can't be so bad. It was an aggressive, horrible woman who basically shamed me every single time I went in there for not being married to my partner. She was like, you need to get your mother to come live with you. If he's not going to be with you because you have a baby together, he'll never be with you. It was terrible. I also heard her um, in a session before me, talking to a woman who lived separately from her partner. I think they were married and she was like, it'll never survive. It was incredibly regressive and terrible. It was nice for me. Um, the final session we had together, my partner got to go with me to meet her and he wasn't allowed in the other ones. I don't really know why. Um, he had been researching like a, a cross country comparative study for his PhD program on like family outcomes based off of social welfare systems. And it was just wonderful to see them talking together. <laughs> she was like, do you know the statistics about single mothers? And he was like, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I know them for Sweden as well. <laughs> yeah, he was like, let's look at Iceland. <laughs> um, yeah. By the way, everybody, Ariella is married now. So clearly yeah. the programs worked, right? It, <laughs> I actually kidding. proposed to him after I saw him tear <laughs> this woman apart. I was like, you know what? I'm rethinking and my stance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they do work. I actually do want to say there's a great book about these programs if you want more information about them. Um, there's an ethnography of one program where the women who are the social workers and therapists who are initiating it kind of deviate pretty wildly from its mandate, but just take the federal money. And they've been really successful because they coach people in safe breakups. Mm -hmm. They help connect people to care. They help connect people to other um, single parents or parents who are working and struggling. Mm -hmm. And the book is called Social Poverty. It's by Sarah Halper Meekin. I wanna have her on the show, but it's a great cool. example of how, you know, a, what would be a socialist approach to helping people through what is a difficult moment. Mm -hmm. Being mm -hmm. pregnant, having a new baby, adopting a child, all of these things are hard and having the kind of robust social networks that that specific program created mm -hmm. was very helpful for these couples. Mm -hmm. It was also helpful that they didn't encourage people to be married. And when a relationship was problematic, they said, here's a safe way to work through your feelings and break up. Here are techniques to cope mm -hmm. with your emotions. Even if you're, you know, living six to a house and you don't have a lot right. of personal space. Right. So I we'll get a to lot that of on another show. Days. I feel like a lot of the Nordic states also have programs like that, mm -hmm. paired, of course, with a very robust like social safety net and yeah. like support for parents and like kids in early infancy. And um, I, I, is it Finland that that has the baby box that they send mm -hmm. all the parents? The box turns into a crib, and there's like little like toys and clothes that come come with it. So. The flip side is they blackmail you by talking to an angry woman who shames you into getting married and then you get the box. Right. <laughs> they hold the box hostage. Yeah. Um